Okay, so we're live on YouTube in a second here. I still see the start webinar button. Okay, I haven't started. I just started YouTube first. Oh, okay. Hey, Jamie, I just joined with my phone because my computer is crap. Can you guys hear me okay? And yeah, see I, me? Can, I can hear you. Yes, okay. it's good Thanks. to see you. Uh, you did freeze. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm really starting it this time. So we're live. And we should start seeing people popping in. It's fun to watch friends come in. I just saw Jim Van Leeuwen. Oh, Jim, woo, woo. <laughs> oh, Sonia's here. From the UMFA, Trish oh. from Antelope Island. Yay. Hey, Hi, Jim. Terry. Jim's my age. Uh, Jim, vaccines, we get to register today. <laughs> they dropped the age in Utah today. Very exciting. I see Joy Emery here. I knew that she was going to be here. Oh, Her yay. Her kid was in a summer camp of mine and he's in college now. <laughs> oh, Aaron's here. Aaron Oren is here, Bonnie. Oh, I knew it. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> it's, it's only, uh, I keep forgetting, is it 3 a.m. he gets up? He gets up at 3 a.m. to spend time with us in, in uh, Israel. Aaron has spent more time at the Dead Sea than Great Salt Lake. Um, so happy you're here and you get up early. Well, while people are still going to be popping in here, I think I'm going to start. We have a really fun poll that we're going to be doing at the end of my little spiel that we need to have a few minutes for, I think. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jamie Butler. I'm the coordinator of Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College. Um, we're really excited to have you for a, the seventh Salty Seminar Series. Um, we're actually um, expanded our salty seminars because people asked. Uh, this is um, an example of feedback that we got. I hope that Seth is going to be here today. He asked for more about dust on Great Salt Lake. And so, um, and, and I thought recreation, everybody wants to get out at springtime and almost springtime and we want to get out. So um, again, uh, we have two ways for you to interact with us at this Salty Seminar. Um, if you have questions at the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A box um, and you can ask us questions and then we will answer those questions live at the end of the seminar. Uh, you can also chat with us and I see that some people have added um, highs into our little chat box and um, if you want to tell us uh, if you have a special lake themed meal or drink that you're drinking, or maybe you want to tell us about what you did at the lake today, please do. Um, we are not going to be holding very many more um, salty seminars. I think everybody's going to be doing field work and getting outside, but there is a QR code in the bottom. Oh, I'm um, there is a QR code that is in the bottom of your screen that you should be able to click on that is to a form that allows us to ask you if you want to hear more things about Great Salt Lake, if there's anything more that we can share with you, please give us feedback. Um, some of the feedback that we have gotten is some of the talks have gotten a little bit technical, um, and we do understand that uh, we we um, hope to, to kind of temper that a little bit. Um, all of this is recorded and put on YouTube. We do use playlist. So you can see um, there's a playlist option at the top of our page. Um, those playlists, you can look on those playlists for 
the Salty Science series. If you want to know more about Spiral Jetty or if you want to know more about Brine Shrimp, we have a playlist for all of those. So uh, please go there. The QR code will lead you on the screen, will lead you to the Great Salt Lake Institute YouTube page. Um, we do have three more events this spring coming up. Um, obviously this one um, where we're thinking about dust and recreating at Great Salt Lake. On March 24th, we've partnered with the algae research supply company um, to grow your own brine shrimp. You can register for a webinar that will last for about an hour and a half. Uh, the QR code in the corner of your screen will lead you to that. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about brine shrimp and we will also send everybody one of these cute little kits that has algae in it and salt and brine shrimp cysts that you can grow in your own house. Um, and you don't need to be a teacher. You don't need to be a kid. If you just want to do this just for fun, because you think brine shrimp are really cool and that they should be the state crustacean, um, you should uh, join us for that. Um, on April 14th, you know, we realized as I was thinking back to the other parts of the series, I realized that we omitted some really important parts of Great Salt Lake. And one of them is salt. You know, we've talked about salt and water and how it impacts the brine shrimp and the birds. Um, but there's so many nuances about the salt of Great Salt Lake. So on April 14th, we've invited uh, Chris Merritt. He's um, the state historic preservation officer who's studied um, the, the railroad and, and Great Salt Lake. He'll be talking about the history of the railroad that cuts the lake into two. We'll be talking to Ryan Rowland with the U.S. Geological Survey about how they measure salt. Um, and then Laura Vernon is the Great Salt Lake coordinator. She will come and talk to us about who manages Great Salt Lake. It's such a big place. And when I started working out there, I couldn't quite um, wrap my head around all of the different agencies. So uh, Laura will be talking to us and we're stoked to have Laura here tonight also to answer any questions that, that um, people might have. And then finally, um, this QR code is going to link you to all of the links and resources that we um, have, have put in the chat boxes that we have talked about um, through this SALTI seminar series. Um, you'll notice um, there's links for this latest one at the very bottom. So um, scroll to the bottom and you'll find some links and resources there. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email any of us. You now know my email because um, um, I never shut up about sending you links to all of that. <laughs> so while we're kind of getting started, uh, we, we, I've never done a poll before. And um, today we got the go ahead to, to do a poll. I'm sorry if I'm disappearing. I have a little bit of light on me. That's funny. Um, so we, we decided that we should do some fundraising sometimes because Westminster just had this Westminster one day where, you know, we asked for money from people. And so we got the, the go ahead to do, um, to do a poll about if you would give money, would you give more money for Jamie to shave my head bald? So you can vote. I think everybody can vote now. Um, uh, would you rather me get a mullet? Would you give money to give me a mullet? Um, or would you leave my hair as is? People are being very nice, Bonnie. I can see the results here. And most people are saying, keep my hair as is. It won't let me vote. Oh, <laughs> oh, cause you're a panelist. I know I'm voting oh. for the mullet though, just in case anybody needs influence about, um, and I, I have some examples of mullet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so people are totally giving more money to keep my hair as is. No. I still, <laughs> yeah, for reals. Right now, shave my head bald has two, that's 8%. Get a mullet is 19%. And keep I my hair as is. If I could, but I can't. <laughs> You're voting. Just, I'm going yep. for the mullet. Wait, wait, wait until you see my slideshow and then see if you don't think mullet. <laughs> we can do I'm another change my mind then. <laughs> I'm already a vote for mullet. I just don't know what mine yet. Okay, so right now 
my, keep my hair as is is 73%. Can't believe you are sticking up for her that way. Wow. No, don't do it. Mullet. 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 Oh. Mullet. Oh. Here's here's the proof. <laughs> See the- <laughs> Gosh. Oh, Very okay. kind audience. I know you people. <laughs> All right. So wh- one of the things we are trying to do tonight is stimulate donations. So Jamie, would you mind putting a link in the chat? And it doesn't matter if it's five dollars or or twenty dollars. Uh, we're trying to, or you know, six thousand dollars. It doesn't matter. <laughs> we're trying to get a number of donations that equals Jamie's age, which is 45. So we're going for 45 donations tonight um, and we won't be able to tabulate them all until tomorrow anyway. So we won't be able to give you real time, but I do in, in case you change your mind and you want to go mullet and your donation can back that up. I just want to show you some of the options. Okay. Is everybody ready? <laughs> Okay, and this is with Jamie's face. I actually used a mullet generator. <laughs> All right, I need to put in mullet number one. This oh, is yeah. Mullet number one. So we, we are going to vote on this too. I have a yeah. poll for this. All right, so keep up with which mullet you like best. There are nine. Okay? <laughs> there are nine. You ready? This is Jamie with mullet number one. This is Jamie with mullet. <laughs> Your hair is kind of long. You could go like this. You're good. It's pretty long. Oh, <laughs> 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 number three. I don't <laughs> the obvious one. winner. Yeah. <sighs> mullet number four um, comes with a special t shirt. <laughs> You've been working oh. out. <laughs> oh. oh man, that one! I'm looking a little Kim Jong. Sort of North North uh, Korean, yeah. 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 <laughs> Kim Jong Un had a mullet. This is kind of a nice '80s rock and roll mullet. Go. I have to learn how to use like hair gel. <laughs> the hair gel, yeah, that would take some hair gel. <laughs> this is kind of a nice. <laughs> Back in the truck redneck mullet, but in the 80s. We're still in the 80s on this one, I think. This one, though. Oh, Wait, is, that if one. Katie is crowd, if Katie is in the crowd, um, Katie is Jamie's sister, and she is actually a hair design specialist. She is amazing. And if there is to be a special mullet, it will be Katie's creation. So <laughs> if Katie is in the audience, she needs to let us know. But this is kind of like glamour mullet. Like that. <laughs> Vanna, Vanna White. <laughs> I can't even. <laughs> There's a lot going on there. <laughs> you have me crying. <laughs> so do you, I need to do the poll now? <laughs> I need to do the poll. <laughs> and let me know Uh-oh. if needs to see a particular number again. <laughs> Oh, oh no. Last one. Oh. Oh, I, um Vicky wants to know how the money raised is going to be used. Oh, um to support undergraduate research in the summer. We are fundraising for um undergraduate research students. Oh, it would be the best. I still can't. <laughs> <laughs> I like this that I you can't vote, Bonnie. It's awesome. <laughs> I can't vote either. I'm bummed. I feel like my power has been stricken. <laughs> so I'm happy far, that number eight is. <laughs> I would vote for eight too. Yeah. Uh, number nine was beautiful. I can't even look at that picture. <laughs> oh, and Jamie, geez. you've already got a red truck, so. I, I do. I do. <laughs> Just the chest here. <laughs> Just so everybody knows, too, the reason I have a virtual background on is because um, I actually am camping right now. So if I were to take this off, you would see my bed behind me and my dishes. (laughs) (laughs) And my dog is next to me. Yeah, there he is. He's cold, Jamie. He's so cold. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I share the results? Is everybody done? Yeah. Okay. It looks like number eight 
Katie's going to be so disappointed. Oh, man. <laughs> the, the glamour mullet doesn't <laughs> win. <laughs> um, so number eight, it is. And which way I've got to look and see which number eight is. I'll show it. Um, Jamie, that's going to take some upkeep. I know. Like you're going to have to style <laughs> I that. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> oh, wait. Wait, oh, oh, yeah. The glamour mullet is it. All right. Oh, Katie's going to, I thought that, I thought that number eight was the one without a shirt. So I feel a lot better <laughs> that there's not going to be surgery involved. <laughs> the Vanna white mullet. <laughs> oh goodness. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so I think, yes, we actually, oh. Amy is actually going to get a mullet. That is actually what's going to happen. But see, Vicki said, um, I forgot to mention that, that she would only vote for a mullet if everybody got one. Oh man, that's not possible. <laughs> my ears I just got a message to, uh, one of the, my, my favorite eight-year-old besides my daughter, who's um, going to be a scientist also, she's voting <laughs> and they're oh, laughing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, okay. Well, thank you for humoring us. Um, again, you know, if you want to donate anything, it will go to undergraduate research for the summer. Um, so the first thing um, I, I really wanted to think about uh, recreation and Great Salt Lake and um, I am so excited that Megan Saunders could be here with us. Um, she is a trainer with Great Salt Lake Rowing and um, she's going to show us some really awesome pictures and tell us more about how to get involved um, with rowing. So join us. All right, can I share my screen? You should be able to share and I'm going to turn my video off so I'm not interrupting. This PDF. Just want to make sure. Um, yeah, I can see it, Megan. Okay, great. Um, so one of the beautiful things about being a rower on the Great Salt Lake is I think we have some of the best views in the world. Um, so I am not native to Utah. The Great Salt Lake was not a place I'd really ever been um, until I started rowing. I found out about a rowing club and I dove in kind of head first, um, not to, into the lake, but into rowing. Um, and so that was my first venture out to the Great Salt Lake was through the rowing club. And I've become a little bit obsessed and have probably more photos of sunsets and sunrises on the Great Salt Lake than is probably acceptable for most people. Mm -hmm. um, but so we, we are a club, we're based out of the Great Salt Lake and we row crew, um, predominantly sculling, which is when you have two oars and a skinny little boat that you get to balance and um, stay afloat in. And it's really, really fun. So I'm just gonna kind of flip to the next one. So if you want, if you're interested in learning more about us, we do have a website. And it's just gslr.org, so greatsaltlakerowing.org. Um, but we do a lot of really, really fun activities. So we're a group that we teach beginning lessons. So I started with no knowledge of rowing um, and am now a coach. Um, so we teach beginning lessons. It's really, really fun. There's a great group of people. Um, one of the things that's amazing about the Great Salt Lake is I think, whoops, this picture on the bottom left, um, was from like January or something like that. So we can row year round because that lake doesn't freeze. It's so salty that mm. we sometimes maybe chip out of the marina with our oars, but once we're on the lake, we're, it's fair game for us. Um, so it's really beautiful to row with snow-capped mountains in the background um, or greenery. Like we get this whole full spectrum um, of environments when we row. Um, in the top right picture, we sometimes we do a yearly um, row out to Antelope Island. So that's really the only way I visited Antelope Island is by rowing out there. It takes about two-ish hours. So it's a long haul, but it's still really, really fun. Um, and the sunsets, guys, I just like, I can't get over the sunsets. Um, and this is just a smattering of sunsets or sunrises. And there's so many more pictures. It was really hard to choose which ones to even include because there are so many. Um, but there is something that is incredibly serene and amazing about being 
out on the Great Salt Lake in the middle of this really beautiful and interesting body of water and then seeing the sun go down. I always joke that it's my therapy. Um, hey, Megan, but, yes. we're only seeing um, one picture. Oh, we no. don't see the other ones. Well, it's one kind of compiled picture. Okay, let's see. Is that a little better? Can you see four images there? Oh, uh, I see four now, yes. Okay, sorry about that. Let me jump back up. So here's, here's more. Is that better? Sorry about that. So anyhow, so those are just, it's just kind of an amazing scenery um, to be able to row and do this really cool sport that's really, really fun um, in this fascinating body of water. And we have people come and they'll, they'll guest row with us and they're always a little bit amazed at this body of water that we get to row on and kind of take it for granted. It's sometimes it feels like it's my own little lake, even though it's a giant lake, it's not little, it's huge. Um, and then one of the other things is we, we love to compete. We're a rowing club that we um, friendly compete a lot. And so last year, 2019, so pre-pandemic, um, we actually hosted a regatta on the Great Salt Lake. And so there's images of just of this regatta. And it was a really cool experience because you had all sorts of crew boats heading out and rowing. And as they were coming back on the finish line, we had this rock um, right along the marina full of people watching and being able to kind of see this kind of cool event go on in a body of water that a lot of people locally don't think there's a lot going on with. Um, so anyhow, so that's a little bit about rowing. We coach beginning lessons. Um, so anyone can come and learn and it is a ton of fun and you can stick with the club and keep keep learning and progressing and jump into some of these group boats or we, we coach in singles. You know, it's loads and loads of fun. And it's been a really cool way for me to experience a lake that I probably would never have realized um, how magnificent it was um, without kind of joining this club and having that be our home body of water. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you wanna, do you wanna learn more? That is That's what I bought for you. I want to learn more and I uh, will put the links at, at the bottom of the links okay. and resources that we shared earlier. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and we'll have um, some of our other club members will be on later to answer more questions. But yeah, come join us on rowing and in rowing and get to know the Great Salt Lake in a different way than most people ever get a chance to. Thank you, Megan. You're welcome. All right, um, Jamie, um, I, I think I am to introduce Sarah. I'm not sure what happened to Jamie, but Jamie's, um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay, so next, we, next up we have Sarah Null and Dr. Sarah Null was here at the beginning of the Salty Science Series when we talked a bit about water and the watershed and water diversions. Um, and we're having her back um, because this topic turns out to be really interesting for what we're talking about tonight. Um, Dr. Sarah Null is an associate professor in the Watershed Sciences Department at Utah State University. She has a PhD and master's degree in geography from UC Davis. And her bachelor's degree, this is always interesting to me, Sarah, is in international economics from UCLA. Her expertise is environmental water management using systems modeling, mathematical modeling, and field studies. Um, recent research includes improving aquatic habitat objectives in water resource systems models and evaluating trade-offs between human and environmental water uses with uncertainty. That would be Great Salt Lake. <laughs> Uh, Sarah has long loved saline lakes. She pursued graduate school after working many summers as a naturalist at Mono Lake in California. Recent Great Salt Lake research includes modeling salt balance between the north and south arms, using water balance to estimate lake level without human water demands, estimating cost of water conservation and, and water markets to provide environmental flows to the lake, and ass assessing water uses and infrastructure that threaten lake ecosystems. Um, so that's her official um, that's her official body of work. And I also would like to say that she is an LOL, a lady of the lake. And we're so happy to have you here, Sarah. I'll turn awesome. it over. Thank you for having me. This is really fun. Let me share my screen. 
make sure everyone can see it. Does that work? Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. So I'm really excited to be here. And this is um, one of those very sad times that I live in Logan that I'm not close to the lake to, to do crew on it. That looked so fun. And I've never even thought of that. But today I'm going to be talking very briefly about maybe 10 or 15 minute talk on Great Salt Lake Watershed kind of 101. So a quick and dirty background about the lake to catch everyone up so that we can all enjoy the rest of the talks later today. Okay, so let's start with where does the water that's in Great Salt Lake, how does it get there? So most of Great Salt Lake water is from stream flow. About two thirds of it is from stream flow. Mostly it comes from the Bear River right up here, also the Weber River and the Jordan River. Um, there's a couple very small tributaries, um, things like Davis Creek and places like that um, down here that feed into Farmington Bay, but Bear River, Weber River, and Jordan River are the three biggies for stream flow. There's some direct precipitation, and then there's a little bit of groundwater, not too much. So mostly surface water, surface contributions from streams are the big source of water. Now, of course, there's no outlet to Great Salt Lake, so the only way that water leaves the lake is through evaporation. So that means that all the salts and minerals, the trace amounts that come down in stream flow stay in the lake and over time it becomes more and more saline and more full of minerals. So now Gunnison Bay, which is the north arm, can be up to about 27% salt, can be near saturation. It's red, it tends to get bacteria and some red algaes. Gilbert Bay is the south arm and it varies depending on how much fresh water the, the lake gets year to year, but it might be about eight to 17% salt with more green algae. And as a reference, oceans are about three and a half percent salt. So really saline environment here. Um, one note on this, you can see it very clearly here, but the, the um, causeway was converted to solid fill in 1959. And so at that time, the lake essentially became two separate bodies of water for the most part. There were two um, very small culverts from 1959 to 2013. And actually in 2012 and 2013, um, those culverts closed because we were worried about the structural safety of the, the causeway itself. And then in December 2016, a new bridge and, and breach were installed in, in the Great Salt Lake. Um, and so that's been exciting, seeing how salt and water are mixing now in the lake from the new breach. So we're gonna talk a little bit about consumptive water uses and water that historically would have come, come into the Great Salt Lake, but now don't because we're using that water for other reasons. So st I'm going to start here on this lower figure, actually, looking at this red line. This red line is through time on the x-axis, and it's showing lake elevation on the, on the y-axis. And you can see the clear downward trend. And this is measured data. This is historical lake elevation. And so you can see a bunch of things. You can see the lake rise sometimes, the lake um, decline other times. It's clearly not a linear, exactly linear pattern. And that's expected because the lake really mirrors the climate of what's going on. So if we have wet years, the lake will rise. If we have dry years, just like this year, the lake will, will decline even more. Remember, there's always evaporation coming off the lake. And then a group of us, um, this modeling was led by Craig Miller, a, a group of us then modeled, um, we first we estimated the consumptive water uses and I'll explain that in a minute. So we, we modeled the water that people use for various reasons. And what would happen to the lake if that water was, was coming to the Great Salt Lake? And that led us to the green line right over here in this graph. And that's showing that again, the lake goes up and down but there's no big long-term trend. Overall, we'd think the lake was, was staying about the same. So this showed really clearly that the lake level is declining and it's because people use water. And we, in fact, we, we think that the lake is about 11 vertical feet lower than it would have been if there was no human influence in the Great Salt Lake watershed. And this, this figure on the top now shows who's using that water. And I'm gonna break that down into a table in a little bit, but this, this figure is nice because it's showing through time who uses the water. 
So one thing we did was look at the stream flow into the Great Salt Lake. So we wanted to say, okay, you know, we we know that there's a lot of climate variability. Could the climate be changing the lake to decline? And this is a figure of stream flow through time and Blacksmith Fork up here near Logan and the Bear River. And we found that that's not true. The, the flow is almost the same. In fact, we tend we're, we've been recently in a little bit of a wetter period. So we ruled out that. And then we said, okay, who uses the water? So here's a nice table and I'm gonna talk about the, the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about these one by one. So agriculture is the big one. It uses about 63% of the consumptive water uses. Mineral exports, so the evaporation ponds use about 13%. Cities, people industry use about 11%. And impounded wetlands use about 10%. And then there's some reservoir evaporation. Um, and so altogether, the lake has declined about 11 vertical feet. Okay, so now let's start with agriculture. So we think this is about 63 of the consumptive water uses. And now I'm gonna really explain this term. So that's consumptive water uses is, is um, probably a term that scientists use a little bit more. But the difference here is there, there will be a lot more water diversions or water applied onto farms and field, but not all of that water is consumptively used. So it doesn't all, um, evaporate or transpirate from plants. Some of it, some of that water that's applied to fields will soak into the ground or might run off fields. And all of that water goes somewhere. It doesn't disappear. And in this case, for the most part, it makes it back to streams and back to the Great Salt Lake. So even though lots of water is applied to fields, not all of that water is used right on fields. But still, agriculture is really the biggie of consumptive water uses. Next big one is the evaporation ponds. Um, and this is, I have a aerial photo here on the left and then the picture on the right, I took in August, 2016. So the lake was almost at its lowest point. Um, and you can see around, this is looking north, this photo from the causeway. And you can see the evaporation ponds out in the distance. The lake itself was dry around them. Um, so the evaporation ponds are used for mineral extraction. So water is moved into these evaporation ponds. Um, it depends which particular minerals are being extracted. Some um, You can extract minerals at different rates, but for example, magnesium is a really um, economically important mineral that's extracted from the Great Salt Lake. This is the, the largest mining of magnesium um, in North America, so it's, it's important to our magnesium supply. Other minerals are as well, but this is a big source of water for the, for, that is used for, in the Great Salt Lake. And then that brings us to urban and industrial uses. That uses about 11% of the consumptive water uses that, that now don't reach Great Salt Lake. And let's start on this figure on the right. This is showing a couple of things. So the colors are showing how much water states use. And the, as we get to darker colors, states use more and more water. So this is getting Utah here is blue. So using 150 to 200 gallons per day per person. And then the numbers there are population change. Um, this this figure is from 2010, but it's supposed to be till 2030. So this is showing that we really expect a lot of population increase in Utah. And primarily, we expect that to be along the Wasatch Front, so in those watersheds that feed to the Great Salt Lake. And then here on the left, I have another figure showing Utah um, Utah water use as compared to other semi-arid and med Mediterranean type climates. And so you can see Utah really dwarfs other water uses. So this is important because this is a big, this is an important source of potential water for Great Salt Lake as we think through um, water conservation. And here in Utah, we have water conservancy districts that ma manage water for, co for communities. We have lots of them in Utah. I've only put a few of them here, like Jordan Valley Water Conservancy District, um, the Weber Basin Water Conservancy District. We have the Cache Water District. So they manage water for the future. And like I said, one of, one of the main priorities of all these water districts is to focus on conservation, um, in part to ma in maintain water reliability into the future for future populations and for places like Great Salt Lake. We've of course had a lot of water development in Utah. This figure on the left is showing reservoir capacity only in the Bear, Weber, and Jordan watersheds over the last century. So you can see, you know, of course we've built many dams to maintain water supply to people and agriculture. And then that brings us to impounded wetlands. And it's funny 
to think about impounded wetlands as being one of the things that could take water away from the lake because most of the wetlands really ring um, Great Salt Lake. You can see them in the, in the map here, all the green areas are impounded wetlands. So they're places with water rights. Um, sometimes the water rights will be seasonal, but they always they tend to have some water rights. They're very much managed. Much of that water still does reach the Great Salt Lake, but not all of it. Again, some of that is consumptively used, so plants actively use that water. They're important habitats to maintain around the Great Salt Lake, especially um, for ducks and shorebirds and those types of populations. And here's a group of graduate students on the left that we brought out. Um, we were at the Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge, um, checking out some of these impounded wetlands. And then I'm gonna end this talk. So that was my very quick and dirty, but I wanted, I know it's on recreation. And so here's a different kind of recreation. This is a bunch of students out at the Great Salt Lake, checking it out, seeing it, and hopefully getting really excited about Great Salt Lake. And with that, there's my contact information and me standing in the North Arm. Oh, how wonderful, Sarah, that was so good. Um, I, I'm really excited to, um, to have you here talking about this and really laying the groundwork for Watershed 101. Um, nobody does it better than you. We have a couple questions um, that I, I think, um, Jamie, should we hold on to those until the end or do you want us to answer, ask those questions of Sarah now? I think we should hold on until the end and see, like, okay. I, I think it'll lead up to some fun stuff. That sounds fantastic. Okay, um, so thanks to Sarah and let's move on to our next speaker. Um, Wendy Wilson is next. She's the assistant park manager of Antelope Island State Park, which is one of our very favorite places in Utah. Um, she has been with state parks for over 21 years and Antelope Island for the past nine years. She enjoys the outdoors and loves to help people understand and make connections with the resources around them. Um, Wendy wears two hats, Jamie always says, when she was the park naturalist for a number of years and it, it, when she was the park naturalist for a number of years and much respected um, in the Great Salt Lake community for her prompt responses. And Jamie, you have to say what the second hat is because you cut that off on Wendy's introduction. Uh, I apologize. I um, Wendy almost let me write her bio and um, I thought that that was very brave of her. <laughs> yeah, insert stuff, I can tell that. <laughs> so, you know, when she first came, it was so great to have um, a park naturalist that, that, that was really interested in the resource and really like teaching so many people about Great Salt Lake and helping um, everybody understand it. And then now she's a manager and she is out there um, in the sagebrush and among the shrikes and the gulls. And um, I just appreciate working with her and having some flexibility for our students that come and work on Antelope Island. So um, I, it's really awesome. It's good to see you, Wendy. Awesome. See, you totally should have just written the entire bio. <laughs> All right. Um, let me um, share this screen. All right. So you're seeing the um, a map of Antelope Island. I'm hoping that's the one you're seeing, right? Are you I'm only seeing you. You're still seeing me. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Let's share that one. That's it. Is that it? Yay! Okay. I don't use Zoom as much as other programs. Okay, so um, this past year, Antelope Island saw between 700 and 800,000 visitors, and that was during the pandemic. And I honestly think that, um, so generally the visitation to Antelope Island includes a lot of foreign visitors outside the country. We didn't have that really much at all this year. And um, I think folks closer to home started to discover Great Salt Lake, or not Great Salt Lake, but Antelope Island specifically. Um, so we had, um, the visitation was um, up a lot um, from about 500,000 the previous year to almost 800,000 this year. So um, really high. And there's really two main reasons that people come to Antelope Island. 
One is to view the wildlife. There is an abundance of wildlife on Antelope Island. Um, bison, the pronghorn antelope, bighorn sheep that were just reintroduced recently, um, mule deer, coyotes, porcupines, um, 250 plus different species of birds. So we get a lot of, of visitors coming to see that, those things. Um, and then probably the second one is, um, and, and with that kind of goes um, uh, exploring and, and interacting with the lake. There's, it's great access to the lake, um, is recreation. So recreation is probably the number two reason, and that includes hiking, biking, horseback riding, camping, accessing the lake. Um, I would say sightseeing in that a little bit. So people love to come to see those things. So um, this is a map that you can find on our website and I'll share that um, with the website itself in just a minute. Um, that just shows the, the, the trails and, and the different um, areas that you can go. So there are about 40 miles of trails on Antelope Island and almost all of them are open to multi-use, um, non-motorized multi-use. So hiking, biking and and uh, uh, horseback riding. And then, um, and it's all not non-motorized, so we don't have, the only motorized use is on the, on the roads itself. Um, and, um, and then there's, in addition to, to those uses, so mountain biking um, is not allowed on Frary Peak Trail um, or Dooley Knob, and horse, horses are also not permitted on those two trails. Everywhere else, is open to all three of those activities. And uh, weekends right now, even in the winter kind of spring months are really, really busy. So if you wanna avoid the crowds, come on a weekday for sure. And then um, I wanted to share our website. So if you're um, wanting to go, you know, learn about what, what's happening, get some publications, the website's a great place to go for that. Um, I, I just wanted to just kind of run through it really quickly just to give a, um, an idea of what, what you're going to find when you come on here. So when you first launch, you're going to end up here at on um, kind of the main page. For the main page, we've got a Discover tab with Frequently Asked Questions, which has a lot of good resources. You know, like, can I bring my dogs and what kinds of, um, I'll just click on it. Um, can I do collecting our dogs permitted, drones, fires, et cetera. Um, it also includes some information on bison safety, drone regulations, a little bit of the history, our dark sky status, um, the little creepy crawlies. We've got a map of the park that is um, a little bit more interactive. So it, it just talks, you click on a different thing and it, and it will show you kind of what that area is. Sorry. Events, and this includes, um, events that we're putting on as a park, either tours or presentations or programs, um, as well as outside events that are coming in so people can come, um, if, you know, to know, hey, I'm coming out on, on you know, March 13th, are there any big events that are gonna kind of impede my access? And this would be one of them. And so we'll talk about what's happening and what you can expect as far as closures or um, impact to the trail system or impact to the roads. We try to limit those types of large events to no more than 10 outside events per year because our main focus and our priority is for the everyday general user. So while we do have um, several events that come out every year um, to utilize the trails and utilize the roads, we try to keep those to a minimum. Um, publications we've got, so um, that overview map, uh, campground maps, and then park brochures in five different languages. And um, several amenities, so we've got um, just all the things that we offer out here, tours and rentals, camping opportunities, and then trails again in the visitor center. And if you're a um, teacher um, wanting to bring students, this is our field trip. Um, page that where you can reserve a uh, place, a time to come out. We ask you to, to schedule those in advance so that we don't have too many schools in one area on the same day. So that just a quick kind of um, quick and dirty overview of our website where you can find that information and just some general information on the park conditions when we're open, 
um, our address and phone number so you can contact us as well. So these are updated frequently, especially the events tab is, is probably the most frequently updated because our events change all the time. Um, okay, so that's just a kind of a, a quick overview of the website. And I would ask that if you have recommendations or requests on things that you would like to see on our website or on our social media, we do have a Facebook page and Instagram page and a Twitter um, page. So if there are things that you would like to see on those, please put those maybe in the Q&A so that we can refer to those later and kind of take some notes and, and update the website in ways that are, will be beneficial to you. One of the things that when I first came to Antelope Island, <clears throat> the well, and this is still true, I guess. The local perception of Great Salt Lake and Antelope Island was pretty negative. And there's still a lot of negative out there, right? So the, the three things that I heard most often that would keep people from visiting um, Antelope Island, um, let me see, let's see, let's, uh, or um, it's buggy. Um, it stinks, and it's just a useless, lifeless rock. Um, and I'm going to try to, I don't know how I got, someone's going to have to save me on this. I don't need all that. What you need, Wendy? I just need to get back to my main screen. This is what I, So are you seeing anything now? Am I sharing anything right now? I just see your Windows screen. Yeah, okay, so I just need to, where do I stop sharing? Actually, I do want to just go back to this one. So we're just going to stay on the screen here. Um, okay, so those three things, it stinks, it's buggy, and it's a useless, lifeless rock. Um, the, the stinky part, it, there are times of the year where the lake actually, it does stink and, um, Jamie would say that that's the smell of science or biology, right? It doesn't stink all the time. It's often um, when it's warm, when we've got some strong winds. Um, I don't know, maybe Jamie can answer this better later, but um, if there are certain times of the year that, that um, kind of encourage that, that stink is, is more noticeable. Right now, honestly, no stink. Um, and often during the summer, you don't smell anything at all. And even when you do, you drive across the causeway and you get out to the island and that smell is just kind of contained in Farmington Bay. So while there is a smell to it, it's kind of that decomposing um, smell, uh, rotten eggs a lot of times, uh, the, the island itself doesn't have that. So usually. Um, it. Uh, the second thing is it's buggy and that is, true, but not year round. So again, right now, there are no bugs. Um, although we have noticed that ticks are out um, in certain areas right now. So there, that's one thing to be aware of is that we do have ticks out here. But as far as the when we when we say are the bugs out, have the bugs hatched, what we're referring to is not just any old random insect, it's the little tiny biting gnats, the no sams. Um, I usually refer to them as little hell with wings. So, and they really are, they're terrible. And they usually hatch around early to mid April when temperatures reach about 65 degrees and then die away in the summertime when temperatures reach about 90 degrees. So um, April, May, and June when the temperatures are wonderful to be a recreating are the worst times to be out here for the naps. And nothing is really effective against them. Bug spray doesn't work against them. Um, head nets, um, fine mesh head nets are what, what we usually use. But after June, um, July, August, September, it gets hot enough that those little bugs go away. There are other insects, um, you know, some biting flies and some mosquitoes. Um, however, those generally tend to respond pretty well to bug spray. So you can come out and um, uh, interact, um, um, go on a hike and go on a bike without too much problems. And then, um, 
come fall, like September, October is probably another really good good time of the year. Some of my favorite times are in that that time of year. So yeah, it's buggy, but it um, if you know the kind of the time of year, um, different bugs will come out at different times. And the only ones that you really need to really worry about are those little gnats. Um, again, that's April, May, and June. And the last one um, that I want to kind of end with is that Antelope Island is this kind of this dead, useless rock. And one of my favorite things is to talk to people who have been out here for the very first time. Um, and I've lived here 65 years and I've never been out to Antelope Island. And, and they're sad that that's the case, right? That um, you know, they come out and, and it's they're in awe. It's they're amazed at the views and the beauty and the wildlife and the recreation opportunities. It really is just a really magical and incredible place. So I just wanted to whip through a couple of pictures um, of the um, this dead, useless, lifeless rock known as Antelope Island. If I had music, we would play that. But you know, taken different times of year, of course, it, it's not dead. There are a lot of beautiful wildflowers. There's a lot of incredible wild scenery. Um, there are about 40. 50 freshwater springs out here and some of them run pretty consistently year round which is where the wildlife get their water from um, a lot of incredible hiking trails uh, winters don't always look like this winters are often pretty clear of snow so that you can recreate year round when the mountains are full of snow you can come out here and hike um, incredible geology it's a, it's a hot spot for geologists to come and study um, the unique rock formations. Um, so just a, a lot of really cool geologic and biological features out here. Some of the coolest rocks, these are um, banded nice, um, almost two, two billion year old rock formations. Um, yeah, so I finally found my stop sharing page. And um, if you have any questions, throw, throw them in the chat. Um, we'll talk to about them later, but um, that's all I have for you. Come out and visit. That is incredible. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that you brought up the no -see I think it's really important for people to know like when is a great time to go and when is a not great time to go. Um, I always avoid going in May, but Wally's going to meet me there for a picnic, he says. So, oh, wait, he mm -hmm. says he's busy. I guess he's. <laughs> yeah, be very busy, Wally. <laughs> 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 um, I am a, I just love Antelope Island so much. And thank you for your introduction. There's nothing more wonderful than being out there and running into Wendy and she rolls her truck window down and has a chat. She can also tell you where to go owl watching and all the great things about Antelope Island. So thank you so much. Um, I, I wanna uh, bring on uh, Dr. Kevin Perry. I, I've been so fascinated by his story and have not had the chance to hear him speak. So I'm absolutely thrilled to um, have him here tonight. He's an associate professor in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Utah. He served as chair of the department for some time from 2011 to 2018. He holds a degree in meteorology, his bachelor's from Iowa State University and a PhD in atmospheric sciences from University of Washington. He's participated in more than 20 air quality projects, ranging from local scale pollution events to the intercontinental transport of pollutants. For the last five years, Dr. Perry has focused his attention on dust plumes originating from the exposed portions of Great Salt Lake uh, and the lake bed. So I, I'm thrilled to have you. I think your work is really important. And as the lake shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, as we're seeing, this shoreline becomes more exposed and your work becomes critical. So I'm, I'm just really thrilled to turn it over to you. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction. And I just want to give a, uh, um, a, just a little tiny brief history of how I got interested in dust. And that was when I was at a, a postdoc at UC Davis. Uh, and uh, I was working for the National Park Service doing uh, air quality studies for the National Park Service and would spend the summer doing maintenance on the equipment in the winter time trying to analyze the data. And we started noticing that there was a lot of dust in the eastern half of the United States uh, during the summertime. 
And uh, its chemical composition was unlike anything from North America. And we eventually traced it back to its origin in Africa, that there was a, basically a lot of dust being transported across the Atlantic and the trade winds and into the eastern half of the United States. Uh, later on, I started studying the transport of dust from Asia to North America and the pollutants that came with it. And so it's not a big leap to see that uh, I was uh, interested in trying to understand a local dust source as well. And so what I get to talk about today is uh, a really crazy scientist uh, doing a really crazy thing about something that I really care about. And I think that's something that's really important. And uh, so I spent two years of my life uh, basically trying to understand all different quadrants of the Great Salt Lake, uh, Playa. So if you were here back in the 1980s, which I was not, uh, the lake looked something like this, very different than it does today. Uh, it was the fourth largest terminal lake in the world. Uh, and uh, the lake elevation was uh, just uh, peaked out at uh, a little over 4,211 feet. Uh, fast forward to 2016, and you can see a remarkable difference in the uh, elevation of the lake. And there's uh, more than 750 square miles of lake bed is now exposed. And to put that into perspective, uh, 750 square miles is about the exact same size as the Hawaiian island of Kauai. Uh, so it's actually quite uh, expansive. And uh, so this picture was taken in December 2016. Uh, uh, just the, the lake was at about at its lowest, um, but here's what it looked like yesterday. Uh, so this is a satellite image. You can see the, the north arm uh, and the south arm being different colors uh, from what was explained before. Uh, and you can see most of Farmington Bay is uh, basically exposed with the, the Jordan River inflow uh, into the lake as well. And uh, Gunnison Island up in the northern part of the lake is, uh, looks like it's attached uh, physically to the land, um, mass again, making it not an island, which is not great for the pelicans. Um, we also know that the long-term trend in the Great uh, Salt Lake elevation is downward. Uh, there's a lot of variability due to uh, weather patterns, but superimposed on that long-term variability uh, is the result of water diversion, as was talked about earlier. Uh, and the long-term trend is about half a foot per decade. And I have obviously long-term concerns about the, the future of this lake. We've seen what happens to other terminal basin lakes when we divert too much water. Uh, the Aral Sea disappeared, uh, and there's countless examples of that around the world, and I would hate for that to happen here. So, you know, why do these water diversions matter? Well, they obviously have impacts on, on the bird habitat, and they alter the salinity, specifically in, in the southern arm, and that could threaten the brine shrimp industry. Uh, it makes extracting minerals from the uh, lake more expensive because they have to uh, dredge more and pump more uh, longer distances to uh, get to the minerals. And, uh, you know, it's, it makes it more difficult for the recreation and the boating opportunities. But what I'm here to talk to you about is the increase in frequency and severity of dust storms. Um, these dust storms can uh, impact our visibility. Uh, Dr. Um, McKenzie Skiles at the University of Utah is doing a lot of work on uh, the impact of that dust on the snowpack and how it affects the water availability. And uh, there's also a potential for this uh, dust to have uh, uh, human health impacts as well. So here we have a uh, webcam footage uh, from the University of Utah looking at downtown. So we're looking to the west. The Great Salt Lake is to the right. And uh, we have a, a cold front that's passing through and it's picking up dust off of the Great Salt Lake and bringing it into the city. And you can see it has a dramatic impact on the visibility and uh, it's a potential health impacts associated with that as well. And so I was basically funded uh, by a DNR and the Utah Division of the Facilities Construction and Management to try and identify you know, what parts of the Great Salt Lake were acting as dust sources. 
Uh, and how might fluctuations in the lake level impact future dust production? And they also wanted me to determine if there were any heavy metals uh, in the dust that might pose a threat to human health. Uh, so I started off on this large odyssey to try and do that. Um, but in order to do that, I had to kind of understand the, the issues that uh, are important for dust production. Uh, one of those things that controls the, the dust uh, emissions from the soil is the uh, fraction of silt and clay. Uh, so that's the smallest particles, the ones that can get lofted into the air. Um, and then, you know, there's a surface crust over much of the Great Salt Lake. I didn't know how much or to what extent it was there. Um, but if you have a strong crust, it's going to prevent the, the uh, erosion of the dust. And then vegetation plays a role in that as well. And we really didn't know how much fine soil was out there. We didn't know the, the surface crust characteristics. And um, we had a little bit of idea of how much vegetation was out there, but not the full extent of it. And so those are kind of physical um, sorts of things with the, with the playa that's out there. Um, but you also need to have dry soil and you need to have strong winds in order to generate the dust. So there's a whole bunch of things that are necessary to generate dust. And so I wanted to do a full survey of the entire Great Salt Lake. And so I divided it up into what we call decision units, um, you know, large areas that uh, should have similar geology, um, similar sources, that sort of thing. And each one of these decision units were then divided up into subunits. And the idea was to do four kilometer by four kilometer boxes um, and uh, then do some detailed sampling in each one of those subunits. And here we're looking at the southern part of uh, Antelope Island, and we're looking at decision unit two and several different subunits. Uh, the subunits are defined by these polygons. And in each one of those polygons, I basically set up a GPS grid uh, that was nominally about 500 meters apart. Uh, and at each one of those locations, I would go out to those predetermined coordinates and uh, catalog uh, the surface crest characteristics uh, the vegetation amounts, uh, and also collect a soil sample. Uh, and I would collect all of those soil samples from a single subunit and put them into one uh, bag, uh, basically to try and get a representative sample. And how did I get to all of these places? Ah, by bicycle. This is where the crazy scientist comes in. Uh, so I decided to do this on a bicycle and a trailer system. I call it the University of Utah Dust Devil. So why did I want to do it that way? Well, for one, uh, it's low cost, it's low impact. If you look on the right, uh, we have some ATV tracks that are out there. Uh, and then in the middle of the ATV tracks, you can see the tracks from the bicycle are much less intrusive uh, on the uh, lake bed itself. Um, theoretically, uh, the bicycle won't get stuck, although that is not completely true. Um, it is possible to get stuck out there. The worst I ever got stuck, it took me about half an hour to get the bicycle and trailer system out. Um, of course, the disadvantages of this are that it's slow, it's really physically challenging, uh, and you have to uh, have the weather cooperate. You have to wait for at least five days after the rain. So, you know, some people have always asked me, why don't you just use ATVs? Well, here's a good reason not to use ATVs. Um, I was actually forced to use one uh, on the Utah Test and Training Range. Uh, they insisted that I not uh, ride a bicycle out there, then they were going to come out with me. I told them it was a bad idea, but uh, this is what we ended up doing. We had wonderful sampling for the first hour and a half. We got stuck and we spent the next nine hours digging it out and basically trying to figure out how to get off of the lake bed with the equipment. So, that damage, unfortunately, was severe, and it's probably going to be there for a really long time. So what did I do? Well, I spent more than 100 days, uh, more like probably 140, 150 days out on the Great Salt Lake uh, bicycling. I uh, bicycled a total of 2,300 miles to do this. Uh, about 90% of it was uh, able to be ridden. About 10% of it was too soft to ride on the bicycle, so I ended up pushing the bicycle about 10% of that. Doesn't sound like much until you think that's 230 miles of pushing a bicycle. Uh, I collected more than 5,000 samples and surface crust observations and collected almost three tons of soil to bring back to the lab. 
And I'm just gonna jump right into the results real quick. So remember that uh, one of the, the criteria for dust production is having a lot of silt and clay. Uh, so those are the small particles. And uh, it's not surprising that the highest concentrations of silt and clay are kind of located near where you have inflow from uh, the Weber, the, the Bear and the Jordan River. Um, so in Farmington Bay, specifically the Eastern side of Sam Farmington Bay, we have higher uh, amounts of fine soil. Uh, we also have higher amounts of fine soil uh, down at the southern part of Antelope Island. Uh, there are some drainages that come in there, Goggins Drain and some others that can, um, can leave uh, fine soils as well. Um, the western side uh, of the lake has much smaller amounts of this silt and clay, so it has less parent material that can act as dust sources. If we look at the northern half of the Great Salt Lake, um, you'll see Bear River Bay. Uh, entire area of Bear River Bay has a lot of uh, silt and clay from the Bear River. And so that is an area that has a lot of parent material, but much of the northern arm uh, has very small amounts of this fine material with the exception of the extreme northwestern quadrant of the um, Gunnison Bay. So the surface crust conditions. Um, so I needed to know, you know, what the vegetation percentage coverage was, and I needed to know the surface crust thicknesses. Um, so we kind of divided it into thick crust, which was bigger than a, a deeper than a centimeter, moderate crust, and shallow crust, which was less than half a centimeter thick, and areas with no crust. And then looked at lots of different features. Um, I was blown away by the variability uh, of the surface crust uh, out on the Great Salt Lake. Um, and then you see really strange things out there. Uh, here's an example of one of these rocks uh, that uh, have moved on their own due to forces as yet unexplained. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's lots of fascinating geologic features and uh, artifacts that are out on the Great Salt Lake as well. So I got some pictures just to kind of show some of the variability. So here's an example of thick crust. Uh, it's eroding. And you could go out here and you could pick up one of these uh, pieces of thick crust and it's almost like a dinner plate. Uh, it's that, uh, that hard. There is no intact thick crust anywhere on the Great Salt Lake. Um, anytime you find thick crust, it's eroding away, which implies that it was formed at some point uh, in the past and is now eroding over time. So there's one example of thick crust. Um, here's another example of thick crust. And this is pretty robust. You could probably drive ATVs on this without any issues at all. Um, and, uh, but there's not a whole lot of thick crust out there. And then we have moderate crust. Uh, here's an, what I refer to as an erodible moderate crust. Uh, it's uh, easily disturbed, uh, but it's uh, between about half a centimeter and one centimeter thick. Here's another example of that erodible moderate crust. Uh, this one happens to be kind of curling up on the edges. You can see that if you drive anything across there, you'll break off those edges and they'll end up being a dust source. And then we have shallow crust. In my naive ideas, preconceived ideas, I thought this was gonna be what I see the most of out there uh, and just uniform shallow crust. And that, that's, uh, there are areas where it's like that, but that's, that's not the norm. Uh, so here we have shallow crust with little tiny uh, pebbles on top of it, and there's a dust storm in the back. Uh, you can see some white uh, dust uh, being blown way off in the distance. The shallow crust really is pretty shallow uh, here, less than half a centimeter, and it's pretty fragile. Um, sometimes you find areas where the, the crust is uh, basically curling up on itself and uh, easily dislodged uh, by activity or wind. And then there are some areas where there's no crust at all. Um, I didn't like these very much. It's impossible to ride your bicycle across the sand, and so you end up pushing. Um, but uh, there are areas out there on the Great Salt Lake where you have sand dunes uh, on the exposed portions. And then you have areas out on the lake where there's been a lot of ATV activity that has completely destroyed whatever crust was there. I have no idea what kind of crust was here before the ATV activity, uh, but there's clearly no crust available. And this is one large uh, source of dust. 
So, and kind of looking at overall of these 5,000 data points across the lake, 67% um, had shallow crust, 4% basically had a, a moderate crust, and 1.5% and had a thick crust. So you add those all together, and you're basically almost three quarters of the lake is protected by a crust uh, of either shallow, moderate, or thick crust. And about, uh, you know, just like 26% of the lake um, has some form of eroding crust uh, or no crust at all. Um, so I kind of look at that as, uh, you know, 25% of the lake is a potential source um, and 75% is currently protected. And so how do we identify these dust hotspots? Well, the dust hotspots are places where you have a shallow crust or no crust, no, you know, little or no vegetation, and you have to have enough fine material to actually be a dust source. And so what do these dust hotspots look like? Well, here's an example where you have a fine, uh, a, a thin crust, a shallow crust that's been eroded and uh, by the wind and the material underneath of it in the middle is actually been deflating and blowing away. Sometimes these dust hotspots merge. Um, well, we'll get to that in a second. Well, here's an example of how thin that crust actually is, that protective crust at this location was really thin and was eroding away. And sometimes those uh, areas merge together into a large dust hotspot. Um, these aren't real common out there, but there are some areas uh, where that is the case. So where are these dust hotspots located? Um, so all of these red dots are places where all of those criteria were met. Um, so we have a significant dust hotspot uh, over in Farmington Bay. That's the one that uh, has the, the biggest uh, potential impact on the people that are living uh, in Salt Lake City and along the Wasatch Front. Um, we also have some uh, dust sources over on the western side, uh, fairly close to the U.S. Magnesium. Uh, uh, production facility over there. And luckily for Tooele anyway, uh, the southwestern portion of the Great Salt Lake uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, dust sources uh, right now. now. If we look at the northern part of the lake, um, the northwestern part of the lake is really the only parts up there in Gunnison Bay uh, that has any significant dust sources, uh, but, far, but uh, Bear River Bay uh, is an area where we had a lot of those fine materials and we have crust that is uh, eroding away that uh, gives a lot of potential dust sources. So really, you know, we have the hot spots all over the different parts of the lake, uh, but my estimation is, is that only 9% of the lake is currently generating dust plumes and that a maximum of 22% of the lake has enough fine material to be a dust source if we were to um, disturb that protective crust. And, you know, the next question was, you know, how do this fluctuating lake level might impact future dust production? Well, the state of Utah actually funded a uh, study in 2016 to use an aircraft to fly over and have a laser beam pointed down to measure the elevation of the lake bed uh, very accurately and creating a digital elevation model. And since we have that model and I have all of these locations of what these dust hotspots are, then I can put those together and I now know the elevation of every single one of those dust hotspots. And we can look at Farmington Bay uh, and we can look, um, the x-axis uh, is basically the Great Salt Lake elevation uh, and the y-axis is kind of a frequency distribution. It basically tells you what fraction of the dust hotspots um, uh, would be covered by water at a given elevation. And um, you can basically see that um, it's linear, which I hadn't really expected, and it has a slope of about 14% per foot. Um, but you'll notice that uh, my dust hot spots uh, were all, you know, at least two or three feet above the current uh, elevation of the lake, um, which is uh, 41 uh, 92 and a half right now. Uh, and, uh, but basically this is, gives us an idea of what the lake level would have to be to cover up the dust hotspots. And we did this for Farmington Bay. We did it for uh, each quadrant of the lake and they tell a similar story slightly differently. This is the Bear River Bay area. 
Um, it's a linear relationship, about 13% per foot, but you'll notice that uh, the best hotspots are a much higher elevation. Um, and you'd have to have a significant increase in the lake to cover up any of the desk hot spots that I observed up there. And then we have Gilbert Bay, which is the southwestern quadrant, uh, very similar to uh, Farmington Bay. And then we have the northwestern quadrant, uh, and the slope is very shallow up there. It's about 7% uh, per, per foot. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, also you have to be at least three or four feet higher than the current lake elevation to cover up any of the dust hot spots that I found up there. So, you know, the summary of that one is, is that these uh, dust hot spots uh, are, you know, very linearly with lake elevation. And the number of dust hot spots uh, is really not going to increase in any of the locations except for Gilbert Bay because um, you know, the Bear River Bay is already pretty much uh, completely exposed. Farmington Bay is almost pretty much completely exposed. And the Gunnison Bay, uh, any further reductions, you'll have a very thick salt crust that'll protect. So, um, you know, Gilbert Bay is where we might have increases in uh, dust production if the lake continues to drop. Um, but the nice thing about it is Farmington Bay is actually the easiest area to mitigate. Uh, you can cover up 50% of the hot spots uh, with a lake elevation of about 4,198, and you can get 80% mitigation by uh, uh, 4,200 feet. It's not quite as easy on the other ones. But now at least we have the data to understand the relationship between lake elevation and uh, the dust production uh, capabilities of the lake. And the last thing I'm going to hit real quick um, is trying to determine if there are any heavy metals out there that uh, we need to be worried about. And uh, just looking at the composition of the dust out there, um, it's really enriched in what we refer to as evaporite minerals, uh, which is not surprising. Um, and the, the most common elements out there are calcium and magnesium and sulfur, strontium, chlorine, lithium, and boron. Uh, normal soils are different. Um, they're usually dominated by silicon, aluminum, iron, uh, calcium, uh, et cetera. Um, but we were able to measure 54 different elements. Uh, so at all of those different 122 different uh, uh, subunits uh, out there on the lake. And we really basically were comparing these to the EPA standards for soil. Um, EPA has set these regional screening levels to determine if the concentrations of species in soil pose a potential risk to human health. And the reason I say potential is because um, just because you have high concentrations in the soil doesn't mean that it's dangerous to humans if they're not exposed to it regularly. So there's a two-part thing here. You have to have high concentrations in the soil and you have to have uh, common exposure. And we don't honestly know how often frequent, how frequently people are exposed to the soil. But we do have data now on whether or not there are things in the soil that uh, we need to be concerned about. And so these regional screening levels are established for residential exposure and industrial exposure. Uh, if the concentrations are less than the regional screening levels, then they're considered safe. And if the concentrations are greater than these regional screening levels, then we need to figure out how often are people exposed to it. And I just wanna hit one element and that's basically arsenic. Uh, arsenic, every single measurement that I took of arsenic uh, was higher than the residential and industrial screening levels, um, basically uh, indicating that if people were exposed to this dust frequently, then it might pose a potential health hazard. And the question that people always ask is, well, is this natural or is this coming from industry? And one of the things that we can do to try and uh, get information about that is to look at the variability of the uh, species around the lake bed. Um, if it's rather uniform around the lake, then it's going to be natural. If there are hot spots, uh, then it's more likely caused by an individual source or sources. And if we look at the you know, coefficient of variation, which is basically looking at how much variability there is, uh, arsenic is very uniformly distributed around the lake which tells me it's mostly natural. Um, there are elements that uh, are, are very um, 
that have a lot of variability, uh, copper, uh, sulfur, uh, silver, uh, phosphorus, chlorine, et cetera. And I just wanna show you an example of copper. Um, so copper had a couple of measurements that were greater than the regional screening levels, but most of them were well below. And the ones that exceeded the regional screening levels uh, are located right where you would expect, uh, basically right next to the um, tailings pile for the copper mine. Um, and you basically have dust that is blowing occasionally from the copper uh, tailings pile uh, out onto the Great Salt Lake. Uh, lake bed, and you can see that in the soil there. And so I just want to summarize there to say that arsenic is that only element that every single measurement was something that exceeded the uh, regional screening levels. There were eight other elements that had some values that uh, exceeded either the residential and industrial or the uh, industrial or, uh, regional screening levels. And we would refer to those as uh, contaminants of potential concern. But the next step in this process is really to try and better understand how frequently people are exposed, um, because that's really uh, going to drive whether or not this poses a health hazard. And I really wanted to have a special thanks to all of the private landowners and public landowners and managers uh, that uh, provided me with uh, permission to cross their land to get to all of the different crazy places along the, uh, the Great Salt Lake, uh, a lot of them are very difficult to access if you can't cross uh, private land. And I just love that little picture uh, out there a little too late in the day. I should have been off, but uh, you got uh, beautiful pictures uh, and I really uh, enjoyed my time out there and what I was able to uh, learn uh, about the ecosystem. So I'll stop there. Kevin, I have a question like first, did you get flat tires out there and how did you deal with that? How many flat tires did you get? Uh, the first, uh, the southern half of the lake, I had no flat tires. The northern half of the lake, I was doing really good until I got up into the area near Locomotive Springs. And every single time flat tires at one point, I had two flat tires on the bike and the two trailer tires were also flat at the same time. So what you do is you obviously um, take all the tools to be able to deal with it um, and you curse a lot and you keep going. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. I, I'm so excited to um, hear about your work, as I said, and I, uh, I am noticing like when I go to the lake with different people, I um, I hear different words for the same thing. So like what you're talking about is like a thin crust or a thick crust or no crust, like geologists have different words for that. And microbiologists have different words for that. And it's so interesting to me to hear all these different perspectives and think about like what is making that crust that way in that space and how, from your point of view, like how could we mitigate dust? I think it's super interesting because well, I think biology is the answer. And, <laughs> and on those lines, you know, Preston asked about the crust, are they chemical or biological? And if they're biological, can new crust be grown? Um, the Utah Nature Conservancy has interesting and promising work happening on growing bio crust and transplanting them. Uh, my short answer is it's both. Um, when you're closer to the, the water table uh, or closer to the, to the actual water, um, there's a lot of things which I refer to as biomats. Uh, they're kind of almost like carpet at some point. Um, and, and you know, when you get further away from, from the water source, then it's a geologic type crust. Yeah. So uh, we've, we've worked, uh, we have a lot of publications on microbialites in the lake, um, studying these mats when they're in the water and what they're doing for the lake. And um, we're, we're currently funded by Lara's outfit, Forestry Fire State Lands, um, to, uh, to look at primary production of those mats in the lake relative to other things. And so I'm super interested in these crusts and which ones are biological and which ones aren't, but you're right. Some of the calcium, um, some of that calcium carbonate crust happens without biology. It's abiotic, and so I, I'm super interested to hear your approach because it's it, it's different, and yet it it yields 
because of the expanse of your track, you know, it yields such interesting information for the rest of us. So that very, very cool. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I would love to open this up to questions for everybody. Um, we can uh, read the questions in the Q&A and spread them around. Does that sound good? Um, so Wally Gwynn, I think this is directed uh, to you, Sarah Null. What is the current status of Mono Lake? Yeah, Mono Lake has yet to meet its target level decided in the 1994 court case. It was increasing for many years and then um, going up and down. And then that most recent drought hit Mono Lake hard and the lake declined substantially between what was it, I think 2012 and 2016 or 17. Um, so hopefully we'll get some, some nice wet years and be able to rebound and eventually meet that target lake level decided by the court. And, and that, uh, that brings me to what that court case was for those who don't know, it's the first time the public trust doctrine was ever used. The, uh, yes, the public trust doctrine was applied to save to, is actually a compromise to increase the lake level of Mono Lake, um, saying that, these, that Mono Lake provides um, aesthetic and recreational uses for everybody. Um, and it was, you know, really for reasons that are familiar to all of us to stop um, land bridges from islands, to maintain the salinity of the lake, to stop dust storms, very applicable to this talk. Um, and, and yeah, that court case was in 1994. Wow, um, I, and it's being, I mean, it has been considered with Great Salt Lake. So I think it's interesting to see how it plays out, but it's sad to hear that Mono Lake has not reached the lake level that we had hoped it would, it would be at um, based on that. So um, while we have you up, Sarah, how could market approaches serve as a solution for all saline lakes and decline and not just Great Salt Lake? Yeah, that's a good question. So in because I've been interested in saline lakes and in Great Salt Lake in particular, I did a bit of research about restoration approaches in other places. And then I paired with an economist that used to be at USU, although now he's gone to Duke. And we looked at cutback markets. So if we made everybody conserve water, we said by 20% because we thought that would bring the lake level to, to a healthy lake. Um, and then we said, okay, what if we allow markets on top of that? So we allow people to buy and sell water. So some people could conserve more and some people could conserve less. So it's the same idea as those cap and trade markets that you usually hear about with air pollution. And we found that, that this, this was not about the perceptions. This was looking at the costs of implementing those markets. And they are orders of magnitude cheaper than um, doing something like building lots of new infrastructure. So we estimated we had a number of uncertainties and sensitivity analyses that we did in terms of the exact lake level and the exact cost. But we estimated about 15 to I think $96 million, which comes out to be about five to $30 per person, depending on that uncertainty. And so if this was something that the state decided to do, these, these, these costs are within the realm of possibility. Yeah, wow. I love, I love that you bring your economics background to your science. I think that's so fabulous. Um, so an, another, Lauren Steele asked, what is, is your unique market approach to restoring Great Salt Lake? And where does the estimated 20% increased inflows that we need from tributaries to restore Great Salt Lake come from? isn't all available water appropriated currently? Not Well, not all available water is appropriated because some water makes, does reach the Great Salt Lake. Uh -huh. I think that's what, I think that what, that's what Lauren means. Yeah. Um, so, so not all water would be needed. And we used the stoplight, um, the, the green, red, yellow lake levels, the, um, that was developed by Forestry Fire and State Land, so Laura's group, and we really use that as a benchmark to, to make estimates of, of what lake what lake levels could be a healthy and sustainable lake levels. And, and really getting into the nitty gritty was beyond the scope of what we did. We wanted to take the other experts and say, this is what they think, and then apply that using a market approach. Awesome. 
Awesome. Um, Brenda Lee has some question, a question for Wendy. Um, Wendy, turn your mic on. Um, how do you protect yourself from bison that you may come across when hiking or walking, et cetera, and would bear spray? That's actually a great question. Um, the question about the bear spray has come up a couple of times and the short answer is we have, we don't know. We <laughs> think that it would protect you, but, um, but we don't know <laughs> because bison have this great big mop of hair and when they come after somebody, their head is down. And so a lot of the bear spray we think would kind of get caught in that hair. But we do want to, I, I don't know how ethical it would be, but we want to try it out sometime. Um, but how, how to protect yourself for, um, when you're out hiking in the trails. So really, so there is, um, you can always go off trail. Um, if you're out hiking and you see a bison um, kind of in your path or close to you, the best way thing to do is if you can, if you can wait, a lot of times they'll, they'll turn, they'll turn around and, and leave or, or continue on. Um, if they don't, sometimes they're just stuck in place. Um, you can turn around and come back, just go back to your car. If you're trying to get to your car and that's the only way you can go, um, go, just go way, way, way around them. Give them, you know, a football field space if you can. Um, for the most part, so bison, they're not predators, right? So they're not, they don't have that chase instinct. Um, when you run, they, they don't have that instinct to chase you necessarily, unless, um, they feel threatened by you. So the, the more distance you can give a bison, the better. Um, if you're running and you come across bison, stop running. They seem to, to act more aggressively towards the faster movement. So slow down, go way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good advice, good advice. Um, another question for Wendy, does the website show the current NAT level? So honestly, the website, Yes, sort of. Um, under the frequently, uh, let's see, the current conditions, we keep a tab uh, on there on how bad the naps are. So, um, so current conditions, and also on our Facebook page, we will update the nap situation throughout the nap season. Um, we just got a comment from Nika: bear spray turns into hairspray. I love exactly. That. Yes. <laughs> yes. I don't think that it would slow them down, but I know okay. that's done. Um, so um, I, I, there's a question about, uh, do you attribute the lake smell to the wastewater treatment plants? And um, I'm, I think I'll start with that because I work on the microbiology of the lake and um, there are a lot of uh, bacteria microbes in the lake that produce sulfhydro gas and um, it's actually really great for turning over the nutrients in the lake. And I think that's where a lot of the smell comes from. So I'm going to say, no, it doesn't have to do with the wastewater. Um, that when you have, um, particularly stagnant areas or when you have receding lake water at certain times of the year, you're going to get some of that, uh, sediment smell kicked up into the air. So I'm going to say that's what it is. But I'd love to open it up. David Parrott, um, who studies microbes that are helping plants around the lake live in their soils. I'm wondering if you have any take on that or if anybody else would like to answer that question. Dave? Um, I don't right now. We're still looking at the like overall population dynamics of soil microbes, uh, which is something that hasn't been looked at very much, if at all, before. So we don't really have a lot to say so far. We're still collecting data. COVID's put us a little bit behind in really getting a good picture, but we might know maybe by the end of this summer and uh, could make some comments. But uh, I'm going to say maybe it's the water and, and not the sweat. The water instead of the water. And I have some thoughts about the smell of Great Salt Lake. <laughs> and I had, you know, I have this idea that I'm going to like get a student to make like a bugo meter and a smell -o meter um, with like some pretty awesome like graphics and stuff. And Wendy actually posed that question. She's like, well, when do you think it smells the worst? Mm -hmm. And, and I think there's two things that I've experienced. 
winds that are turning over that deep brine layer or like those shallow areas. Mm -hmm. And when it's hot outside, it stinks. Like there were times that we would be driving out to go sample the lake. And I mean, it would burn my nose, nose hairs off. I think that was a, a, a quote from Jim Van Leeuwen, who's also here. I mean, it, 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 when it is really smelly and those um, microbes are really like doing all of their stuff, it is very smelly. Yeah. Smells- I mean, it, it smells like science. <laughs> it smells like science. Exactly. But I do think it's microbial and not, um, yeah. not that wastewater isn't also microbial. It is, but I, I don't think that's what you're smelling. I think it's actually the natural process of the lake. And, um, you know, I grew up near the ocean and the marshy areas had a smell as well. Um, so I, I think that it is sort of a natural um, microbial population doing their thing. Oh, and, and dead brine shrimp smell really bad too. I do know this. Um, Robert wanted me to, wanted us to say this and they do, they smell very bad. Um, brine shrimp harvesters sometimes smell very bad too, because they're working around them. Um, oh, wait, Jim Van Leeuwen is pointing out the Farmington Bay North Davis treatment plant might be contributing to the smell. Yeah, I'll go with that, Jim. I'll, I'll take your word for that because Jim has spent <laughs> more time on the lake than most people I know. Um, so uh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Lauren Steele has a question um, for Kevin. Um, do you have an estimate for how many tons of dust would be released in the case that Great Salt Lake would dry and the entire lake bed were to be exposed like Lake Owens? Uh, So the short answer is no, but I do know that uh, as the lake continues to go down, you know, Farmington Bay, uh, Bear River Bay, and Gunnison Bay are not going to change that much unless the crust, existing crust, uh, starts to erode, which I think will happen as we move forward. Um, So, um, (laughs) but uh, in terms of the emissivity of the individual dust sources that I identified, we don't have data on that yet. And uh, we're just starting a, a five-year National Science Foundation funded project um, where I finally uh, was able to purchase a, uh, an equipment that'll actually allow me to go out and measure the uh, dust emission from each of these individual uh, types of locations so we can see you know, what the variability is. But I wanna put this into context with uh, Vicki's question about other dust sources. The Great Salt Lake is just one of many uh, you know, terminal lake basins in the Intermountain West. And there are many, many dust sources. Uh, you, know, you think about Severe Dry Lake area or Thule Lake down south, um, you know, the entire West Desert area um, you know, is another area that uh, has been shown to be emissive in terms of dust. And of course, uh, fires uh, have had an impact on the uh, destroying or um, altering the, the bio crusts that are uh, in the desert. And when those are disturbed, they can become sources as well. And so, um, you know, in terms of the pantheon of all of these different dust sources, the Great Salt Lake right now is not the dominant source, uh, but I'm concerned that uh, the longer it's exposed, uh, the more erosion will happen on these crusts and the more emissive it will become. And that's my long-term concern. And, uh, you know, Vicki mentioned about the salt flats uh, out to the west. It's not really the salt flats. It's more of the west desert uh, being the area that is emissive. And, you know, Greg Carling down at BYU had done some chemical work along with McKinsey Skiles and of uh, dust that's in the snowpack. And uh, at least uh, in the couple of years that they were measuring it, um, the bulk of the snow of the dust that was being uh, deposited on the snow was actually coming likely from the West Desert and not the Great Salt Lake. Uh huh. Uh huh. So thanks for that question, Vicki, um, about source of dust. That's so interesting. Um, as Shauna asked, did you find um, did you find fresh water springs exposed in the uncovered lake bed? I found all sorts of amazing things, both uh, artifacts of of human existence and also geologic. Um, Picture behind me, I Mm. refer to it as Oasis. 
Um, you just don't expect, you know, things like that out there. But there were freshwater springs uh, that I could find out on the lake bed as well. Um, you know, and the the evidence of, you know, you think you're, you're miles from shore um, and you wouldn't think that there'd be a lot of evidence of, of uh, wildlife activity out there, but you see the coyote prints everywhere. Um, I even saw mountain lion prints out there one time. Uh, and uh, there's just the amazing, uh, you know, things that are going on out there. It was just a, a really enjoyable to, to learn more about it. That is awesome. I have a question for you, which is um, when I was on sabbatical um, a, a few years ago, I decided to read uh, Stansberry's journals, um, the whole Stansberry book and the whole uh, John C. Fremont book. Wow. I found them really contrasty because Stansberry was such an optimist and he was so elated with everything he discovered. Um, and Fremont was such a downer. He was so angry about dragging his boats through the salt muck. And, <laughs> and then I thought to myself, well, maybe they were there. Obviously they were there different years. Maybe the conditions were very different because how many times have I said every time I go to this one particular site at the lake, it's different, you know? So maybe they, they got really different. Maybe it wasn't about their persona. Maybe they got really different things thrown at them, but I do want to, I did want to know if you've read Fremont because his discussion of going around the lake and dragging his boat and, you know, his, ox are dying because there's no water and he's so frustrated and he's so angry and depressed and you think he's going to kill himself like that's really like interesting compared to what you did on a bike i i just would love to have your reflections on that so if you haven't read it i really want you to read it and get back to me <laughs> i have not read the stansbury i have read the fremont and let's just say that uh it struck a chord um yeah, yeah. Felt his pain. I knew exactly what he was talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about the things that, that were dangerous that I had to deal with, um, the, the most obvious danger was lightning. Uh, you had to be very careful to make sure that uh, you paid close attention to the weather and you had an escape route and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, the bison, obviously, you just give them the, their distance and you, you don't worry about that sort of thing. Um, what I hadn't expected to be dangerous were people. And it was at one point that I was actually shot at. Uh, and uh, I was out there. And uh, after that, I started wearing Hunter's Orange the entire time I was out there so that people would not mistake me for anything else. Um, but uh, yeah, that was kind of exciting. I think Laura, Laura can tell you that state employees deal with that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And there's some good questions also in the chat. Ian wants to know about their proposed dams on the bear. Will dams decrease the amount of silt reaching the lake and thus decrease the dust from the area? Um, also, how will the dams affect the water reaching the lake? Oh, that's kind of a Sarah question or maybe a Laura question. I was just thinking, I can't wait to hear the answer to this because I'm not sure. So. <laughs> well, I could, I could take a stab, but I don't know if I'll get everything. So the water, the, the dams are estimated to reduce the water by about eight and a half inches. So not a huge change from what we've already seen. The turbidity of the water. So of course, dams will hold some sediment back in their reservoirs. Um, I wouldn't think that it would make a large difference to dust deposition and and Kevin jump in here if if I misspeak just because I would think there's already so much silt on the bed of the Great Salt Lake and the, and the surrounding playa that it wouldn't make a big difference but I'd like to hear your answer Kevin if you yeah, have your take on that. I, I think that your assessment is correct that uh, the areas near these inflows, I mean, they've, they've been doing that for, for thousands of years and there's a significant amount of silt uh, there uh, that's already just waiting to be deflated. I do love that question though. I have never heard that question before and I'm just continually like learning about the lake. So thank you, Ian, for asking a question that I've never heard before. 
And Joy wants to know, uh, Kevin, what months did you do your research and are you planning on getting out for more bicycle driven research? So the only month of the year that I wasn't out on the lake was January. But if you look at the distribution of when I was out there, uh, the summer months obviously are, um, you know, when I did most of my research or most of my, my uh, forays, but, uh, you know, there was a significant amount of time in, in February, March, April, and, and, and you know, into, uh, you know, October, November, and even December a little bit as well. Um, but the key was, is you had to wait for at least five days after it rained. Otherwise, it didn't matter what season you were in, it was going to be unwritable. And you saw the picture of one of the days uh, that uh, I went out too early, um, and it was just a mess. Yeah. And I plan on going out again. Um, when I finished up on uh, in, in uh, 2018, I swore I'd never do anything like that again. Um, but uh, now with my new uh, project, I'm going to be hauling equipment out there. I'm not going to do a systematic survey again, um, but I will be going out to revisit some of these places and measure the dusty missivities. Um, and uh, what's interesting is the places that I have already revisited um, really haven't changed much. Um, so that actually made me feel better that I was treating my data as a snapshot when it was really a, a two and a half year uh, odyssey. And there are some places, frankly, that, uh, you know, I probably should go back and redo because, uh, you know, I, I was there during a time period when it was a little wetter and it wasn't quite as emissive as, uh, as it is. I've, I've seen some things like that, but I did my best. And uh, it was an amazing odyssey. I, my new favorite word is emissive. I'm going to use that tomorrow three times. <laughs> <laughs> While I'm also choosing Jamie's mullet. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'm so excited to hear from all of you tonight. This is really, really fun. Um, I, I, uh, Jamie, do you have any other questions to throw out? Well, I, I guess um, I was curious too, you know, we were kind of talking about recreation and maybe Laura has just a couple words to say about Fremont Island, um, yeah, Free, Fremont Island. Oh, first of all, I do want to say, um, hey, Laura, can you take ATVs on the bed of Great Salt Lake? Nope, you sure can't. <laughs> Motorized vehicles are not allowed on the lake unless you have a permit from us for a specific reason. Um, the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands manages the bed of the Great Salt Lake. And so, um, as you've heard, with this low lake level, we have a lot of lake bed to manage. And um, on that lake bed, motorized vehicles are not allowed. So, um, would you like me to talk a little bit about uh, Fremont Island? Yeah, say a few words about Fremont Island. I'm hoping there's a lot of people who like to recreate at the lake. I know you have a really awesome story about riding your bike out there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, speaking of bikes, and um, I can, I definitely relate to um, Kevin's pain, and I only rode seven miles. Um, so just really briefly, um, Fremont Island is now um, owned by the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. The Nature Conservancy approached us about, well, in the summer of last year, saying, what would you think of owning an island? You own the bed of the lake. What do you think about owning the island, managing it for the public trust like you do the lake bed. And we thought, oh, well, we don't manage islands yet, but we would consider that. And so um, we had a seller who was a conservation, or sorry, a conservation buyer that was willing to buy the island and donate it to, um, to the Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands. Um, prior to transferring the, the deed, we worked with the Nature Conservancy and the land, or the the conservation buyer on developing a conservation easement for this island. So it's just north of Antelope Island, the third largest island, I believe, uh, in the lake. And um, so we developed a conservation easement, then we took ownership of the island. The Nature Conservancy maintains the conservation easement in perpetuity. Um, and so we are allowing um, public access to the island. We allow it by foot travel. So um, off the Davis County Causeway, um, you can also access the island by boat um, out of the Antelope Island Marina. At this point, it's just flatbed boats like airboats. The marina is not deep enough to take a boat out. 
please, a kayak would work, but um, larger whole boats will not work. Please don't try. Um, and then the third way is by air, but you need to have a permit from the division to, um, to land on the island. And so um, this is our first stab at managing an island. We know that people want to get out there and uh, recreate. It's something new and exciting and open spaces have been inundated during COVID. And so I know people are searching for more areas to get away, um, but we just, this island is not super hospitable. It's been beat up. There's no access to water. There's very few roads. There's no infrastructure out there. Um, it's a super interesting raw place, but um, if you're gonna go out there, be prepared. You need to be prepared for a seven mile trek out to the island. Um, actually on foot and then it's about seven to nine miles on uh, by boat from the marina and so be prepared be prepared for bad weather to kick up and yeah to turn your boat right around um, anyway that that just happened the transaction happened in December so we're actually working on a property management plan right now we met last week with a bunch of um, stakeholders to talk about how to effectively manage an island it's new to us and actually just as of today, there is some um, heavy equipment on the island that is now off. And so we're like making big strides to clean up the island and make it a place where, um, where the island can rest and birds can rest. And so anyway, be mindful and be careful when you go out there. I think you need to bring, I think you need to read um, Fremont's 19th century <laughs> before you go. That should be the you make people read that before they go. I haven't read it. Can you send me the link or like yeah, share it with yeah. everyone? That would be fantastic. Yeah, I will. That's fantastic. I, I, ac I actually have one more question for Wendy. Yeah, go. Can I ask Wendy another question? What I, I know that um, you know, there's more campsites being built on the island. Like, what do you feel like the future of outdoor recreation on Antelope Island is? What are you looking at and planning for? The main thing is trying to find a way to um, manage the, the larger crowds in a way that is still sustainable to the natural resources of the island. So historically, um, at least since it's become a state park, most of the recreation has taken place on the north 2,000 acres. And then everything south of what we call the 2,000 acre fence is, is more or less untouched except for some trails and the historic ranch. Um, so most of the development that, you, that will, as we do development to help um, spread out the crowds will be mostly on that north end. So yeah, so that campground, it's, it's almost 40 new sites with water and electricity hookups. Um, and then we're looking at um, trying to disperse the most heavily impacted trailheads to other areas of the, of the island that are less impacted. Um, so really that's it is it's, we're, we're trying not to just react to the crowds, but we're trying to take a, um, I don't know, a, a, a close um, look, uh, a responsible way to try to mitigate and spread those crowds out um, in ways that it's not gonna impact the island too severely. Um, there's that impact's going to come, unfortunately, with 800 plus thousand visitors, um, that impact's going to happen, but we're doing what we can to kind of spread that out over space and over time, um, you know, trying to come out during the less busy times and not everybody come on the weekends. So. Um, Laura, I did have a question about access to Fremont. Um, you didn't mention bikes. Is, is I know, and that's the way that most people right now that I see are going over, is that Bikes are allowed, actually e-bikes, bikes with motors um, are not allowed without a permit, but, um, but yeah, bikes are allowed. Travel by bike or foot is okay, but like um, Dr. Perry mentioned, if there's been any rain and I can attest to it, it, it is not rideable. It's your bike sinks. You wanna have the fattest tires possible. I didn't when I went out there, um, but yeah, that would, be of most help and make sure that it's just dry when you when you head out there. So. Yeah. Oh. And I guess I should say also this this portion of the causeway, the sandbar, um, 
that you leave the Davis County Causeway from, that property is Davis County's and they really value and cherish that road. And so um, you're not allowed to park on that road. You can park at the marina or you can park up above the gate for Antelope Island, um, be dropped off or whatever, but there's no parking on the causeway right there. So you need to prepare for an extra couple miles of commuting on the causeway. It's actually shorter to get it from the marina, from the parking at the marina than it is from the other. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, Ian, uh, while, while we have Laura, Robert says, Laura, I see that commercial photography needs to be permitted on Fremont Island. I'm sure it applies to large productions, but what about small commercial projects, wedding pictures, et cetera? Yeah, photography, any photography on sovereign lands, commercial photography requires a permit, um, technically. So that would include, you know, where, where you're receiving, um, a, where you're receiving revenue from the operation, you would need to get a permit from us, which would include wedding photography. But we do understand this happens and <laughs> we can't be there for everything, especially out on the island. Um, but yes, it's a permitted activity, photography and video production. And does that cost money? Laura? Yes, um, I do not know off the top of my head how much the, the permit is, but it is affordable um, when comparing to other, um, you know, permits on BLM land or something like that. Um, the one-time cost is quite affordable. And I'm happy to follow up with folks on, on those if they'd like to get them. Yeah, and uh, Robert also thought we should vote on who has the best spiral jetty background. Can you tell where Spiral Jetty would be in my picture? It's there, but it's not in my picture. <laughs> Jamie, are you on Gunnison? Where are you? Oh, yeah, there, there. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> I was just going to show you my friend. I'm hanging out with my friend, the Pelican. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I did. I know. Um, hey, Jamie and Bonnie, just one other thing about Spiral Jetty and recreation use. I don't know if you've talked about it in the other um, series, but recreation use has increased exponentially out at the Spiral Jetty too, to the point where the county is, and our division is very concerned about um, the health impacts out there. Um, and so we're working with Box Elder County and adjacent landowners to try and get something, some infrastructure out there that will allow for increased visitation. There was also a push by Box Elder County to make Spiral Jetty a state monument so it could further draw attention out there. Um, I know you guys have talked about it. It's in all these pictures, um, but that's also a recreation concern that the division has as well. So we're working on that. If you guys have questions um, or concerns, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, the more, the more, and the more stories we have about overuse, the better because we'll be able to take that to legislators and people to get funds to fix things out there. Well. Um, uh, we should know. I'm sorry, Jamie. I, I was going to say Jamie should say something about the visitorship because she's been measuring it. Yeah. So just just so you know, Laura, we do have a car counter out there. And if you ever need data, we know. And I just want people to know we're not monitoring people. We're monitoring cars just to see, you know, for safety issues. But for Laura and managers, we do have all of that data when people go out. Um, we can kind of anecdotally say like what that is, but we've seen exactly what Wendy has described. Um, there in COVID times, we've seen three times the amount of visitorship. So we, if you ever been, need that, Laura, just let me know. I need it now. I've been actually meaning to email you all week about that, but we have a meeting with a landowner and Box Elder County next week. And so I would love to be able to provide that because the landowners don't, aren't aware of the increased use out there. So if I could show that to them, it'd be super helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, we would love to Thanks. help. You. We're working with DIA Art Foundation as well, um, coordinating with Jamie and, and at the other Jamie at Forestry Fire State Land. So um, I, I think we're in on that discussion, but I would love to, we, we would love to make that data useful. So fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody. We have some pretty big thank yous. Um, the mullet competition has gone a little wild tonight and we've actually raised some funds. Um, Dave, do you wanna take over? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, we have some thank yous uh, to some people who have donated tonight, and that's uh, it, you know really awesome. Um, like we said, every dollar that you donate goes right to funding our students. Um, we fund a lot of students at Westminster, and so um, we get a lot of undergrad uh, undergraduate research done with these with, with these monies, and it's really awesome. Um, so big thank yous to uh, to Preston Chiaro, um, uh, Vicki Turner, Sarah Knoll, um, all people who have donated. And then a special thank you to a couple of former students of Westminster, one who did research with me at the lake, uh, Emily Calhoun, and then Chloe Fender as well. Um, all of them are really pushing for this mullet. I think this is the big driving force. <laughs> You know, the mullet, the power of the mullet. Um, and I'm really hoping either for the glamour mullet or a mullet that wasn't seen um, that I really like, which is sort of a, uh, a sort of Lord of the Rings-esque kind of, um, uh, I don't know, not a nymph, but a, like an like a elf mullet. That, that's also, I think it would be a really, really good look. It's, it looks good for the summer, maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, out on the lake <laughs> post COVID. But, but yeah. didn't he have like a little braid too? Like that might be tricky. Yeah. 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 You know, maybe throw Star Wars in there, you know, because of the connection with Mars and the lake, you know, maybe sort of a Star Wars esque mullet. Um, that, that, that could be a thing as well. So thank you all. Um, and if you are curious uh, or want to fund our cause of just general research at the lake and uh, getting students involved and getting uh, students. And the students actually are really cool because they carry this message out to the greater community. Um, and so we're sort of seeding the next generation of uh, lake advocates. So um, yeah, it's, it's really cool. So if you'd like to donate, I think that, uh, that uh, either Bonnie or Jamie is gonna throw that link up again, um, but you can always check out the, uh, the Westminster website and uh, search around there and, and find ways to get us money. We would so greatly appreciate it. And we'll, we'll be on social media. You know, we didn't get approved to do this fundraising effort until an hour before. So find us on social media, check out the links and resources that we linked to earlier. If you have any questions, um, you know, my email, you can email me and I can point you to people. I can um, give you pictures of me with a mullet. I uh, will answer any questions you have. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you for caring about the lake. Um, and thank you, especially to all of our panelists, um, Wendy, Sarah, Kevin, um, Laura Vernon, thanks for as, um, answering questions. And um, I know Diane and Malika are here from Great Salt Lake Rowing. Um, thank you so much for everything you do. And I hope I get to work with you in the future. I don't know if you can see the <laughs> This is the mullet that he is asking for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, thanks for inviting us. This is Diane. Oh, good. Thank you, Diane, for coming. I hope I get to work with you in the future. Yep. Fascinating stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good. Y'all. Bye, you. everybody. Have a good night. See you, everybody. <laughs> okay. Who's here? We've got 13, 12 people. Well, my camping trip didn't impact things too much. I, rec I paused recording. Oh, thank you. You want to stop it or? Yeah, and I'm going to, hold on, I got to stop YouTube also. <laughs>